Hello everyone and welcome back to the last lecture of Advanced Deep Learning for Computer Vision course. Today we are going to talk about active learning. One of my favorite topics and one of the topics I'm doing research. Hopefully by the end of this lecture it is also something you're excited about. So let's start. In the last lecture we talked about semi-supervised learning. There you had a data set which has some images that were labeled and most of the images were unlabeled. The goal of semi-supervised learning was to somehow infer labels for the unlabeled images, so in order to be able to use them for the training. So what we did in the, list, in the last lecture, we explored several ways of how we can use the unlabeled data, despite that they don't have a real label, despite that no one has, done manu has manually labeled them, to use those data to train a neural network. Today we are going to have a similar setting when still we have a data set, but this time the data set is entirely unlabeled. However, we have a labeling budget. So we have like uh, either some money that we can pay someone or we can afford to spend some time into labeling some part of the data set. And the goal would be how can we label the most interesting points, the images, that if we use them for training would give us the best possible performance. So again, like just to recap, there is a large data set of unlabeled data right there. And the easiest way to get these data sets is probably by crawling the internet. So it's not very, very hard to get unlabeled data. The problem is how to label them. And now in our setting, we can afford to label only a few data points. For example, we could crawl like, I don't know, like millions of images, but maybe we can label only 10,000 images or maybe 100,000 images. So we have like a number, a budget that we have to be inside of that budget during the labeling process. And the task is of course, of course, how to select the most informative samples to label. Obviously, the easiest way to label, to decide like what images we're going to label is to just randomly sample them. But if you just randomly sample images, maybe most of them are not going to be informative and they are going to be similar to each other. So by just random sampling, we are it's very unlikely that we are going to get the best set of points for which we could, uh, on which we could train a neural network. Clearly, something more interesting and more intelligent than just random sampling needs to be done. And now someone might say, okay, this, yeah, like we could do this maybe and get interesting images, but do we actually need it? Like, why not just label everything? And the problem is that there are domains that it's very hard to label images. For example, in medical imaging, it's not that you could just uh, ask anyone to label the data there. Like you need doctors, like highly professional doctors who are able to actually label the data and they're going to cost a lot. So you cannot just label millions of medical imaging images data. Another domain that it's probably even more interesting for me because I have worked on this in the past is autonomous driving. Like there are millions of uh, driving of uh, cars who are like in the road and who are taking images and you cannot just label all the data that those images, those uh, cars are taking all the time. For example, this is like from a lecture of uh, Tesla's director of AI research, Andre Carpathy, that he was showing exactly this problem, like Tesla has, I believe, more than a million cars right now in the street, and those cars, all of them have like a camera, and they are taking like data all the time. So you can imagine like one million cars, like taking a lot of images every day, and Tesla is essentially getting maybe billions of images every day. And clearly like you cannot just label billions of images. You cannot just give like to people to label them because it's just going to take forever and it's going to have like a crazy amount of cost. Furthermore, even if you could do that, we could argue that it's not actually good to do that. It's not beneficial for the neural network because most of the images are going to be boring. Like it's just gonna be maybe a car during the day and nothing else on the other side of the car. So adding that image to an already trained neural network, it's probably not going to make that network improve. However, there are some images that are highly interesting, images that are very different to what you have in the data set. 
and he showed here like some images for example here you see like a street with a lot of illumination going on and here probably there is this bounding box here which is actually a pedestrian here or here like we have a few cars but because of the shadow of the bridge like it makes the image like look very different and actually very hard to also understand what's going on. So you can see here like uh, what he showed are like images in different types of illumination, which are not like most of the images that someone might have in their data set. So adding this type of images might actually improve the learning of the neural network. Of course, there could be like other types of images. For example, this one we have like uh, like vents on top of each other, like trucks on top of each other, or here, like whatever this thing is, or here, like a boat in the street. So these are the images that your neural network has not seen during the training in a standard data set. And if in during inference, like when the car is actually driving, would see these images, it might be highly confused because it has not seen this thing on the data set. And now it doesn't know what to do with this. It doesn't know how to classify it. Maybe it doesn't, even it's not even able to find the to find that this is an object like to put the bounding box here so then it's just going to ignore it and it might hit it which would cause an accident which might also means like losses of lives so one way like to improve your neural networks a lot and then to improve like the car like the autonomous driving system of the car is to actually be able to label these most interesting data, these data that are highly different to what you already have in the data set, and then adding this data on your uh, data set. So then training the neural network that your detector, for example, also on this type of data, so that next time it sees something very similar to the, this, like something that it's uh, dissimilar to the previous data that you have, actually it won't get confused, but your uh, neural network will be able to make some decision there. First of all, it will be able to detect that here is an object, and then it should be also able to evade it to not hit it. Now, from this talk, like Karpathy said that actually like it's probably easy to find like 99.99% .99 of scenarios, like, like your car is knowing will know what to do but going to that last uh, 0.1 percent that's like the hardest part and but still we need that part like we need uh, a neural network to be able to deal with uh, whatever type of images it's he's going to see like a human for example even if it has ne never seen like a boat in the street it will know that when he's driving like a driver you know that you cannot hit it because then bad things might happen while a neural network, if it has never seen such a thing, it might just not be able to detect it at all and then it would hit it. So like the goal of all these companies like Tesla, Nvidia, Google, Aurora, Argo, like would be to improve their uh, autonomous driving system. And one of the ways that they can approach this is by adding more interesting data, more data that it's highly dissimilar to what they already have in their data set and then training the neural networks there. So I hope this serves like a, as a motivation, like as an intro to why actually we should care about this problem. Why it's not enough to train only on your data set. It's not enough maybe to also use uh, unlabeled data, but you still need more. Maybe you need like a combination of uh, being able to use whatever data you had, but also to add like highly informative data points that are very dissimilar to what you already have in the data set. Now let's sort like how this can be done because maybe I convinced you that active learning is important and how would active learning, how is active learning usually done in practice? Now there are many ways of doing this and we are going to explore many of these algorithms but more or less the idea in all of them is relatively similar to each other. We have your label data set which is going to have like for example some images from uh, x, y to x, n, and then the labels of them from y, one to y, n. And then we have here like a learning model, theta. So this could be like a neural network, for example, an object detector. We give the label data to the neural network, and then we train the neural network. After we train it, we use the, we apply the neural network into your unlabeled data set, which has a lot of unlabeled data. And then we are going to get some score 
for every unlabeled data point in the image, for every x1 to xn unlabeled. And this score, it's like the entire topic of algorithm of active learning, like how to find the best score that it's going to be for every image. For example, one possible score for one image might be like the entropy of that image. And then we collect like the entropy of every image in the data set. Then we have this active query selection. We choose to label the images with the highest score, whatever is that score that we defined. For example, if our labeling budget is 10,000 images and we can do like 10 times, like to label 10 times 10,000 images. So we train like this network, we infer like the score in the unlabeled data set, and we just take the 10,000 images with the highest score. And then we label them, like we give to some human to label them, we put them on the labeled data set. Now your labeled data set is going to have like all the images that it had before, plus these 10,000 images which we just labeled. Then we iterate over this process, we feed Again, like all this data to the neural network, we retrain it. And then we use the neural network to get like scores for the remaining images on the unlabeled data set. And then we select again, for example, 10,000 images. And then we repeat this process as much time as uh, we have, like as many times as we have budget. For example, if this unlabeled data set had, I don't know, 1 billion images, but we are, labeled, we are able to label only 100,000 images, like 10 times by 10,000 images, we repeat this process 10 times until we have spent our uh, entire labeling budget. And then we do a final training when we train your network into this uh, entire labeled data set, and then we deploy that network in practice. The hope is that by doing so, we are going to find the most informative points on the unlabeled data set. The points, the images that are most dissimilar to what we already have. And in this way, like training a network into this data set here, it's going to be relatively, like have the performance that is relatively close to what would have been if we had uh, labels in the entire data set here. Now let's see how this is done like with like let's go deeper into some of the algorithms that uh, do active learning for example before deep learning like one way of doing this was something that was called by as a query by committee for example you have an image here and this is like a clear image we have like a cat that looks like very clearly a cat we feed it to a classifier and the classifier is going to set hey this is a cat and then we do the same like we give the same image to another classifier for example, here we gave to a logistic regression, now we give to an SVM, and it's going to say that, yes, this is a cat. And here, for example, we give to another classifier, let's say to a random forest or to a Adaboost classifier, and it's going to say again that it's cat. Now, we have like three different classifiers, we fed uh, the same network to all three of them, and they all agreed that this is a cat. So then we say, okay, it doesn't seem interesting because to whatever classifier we're feeding this image, it's going to give us the same uh, answer. So clearly this is a, this is a, an easy image, an image that the classifiers have seen before and they are not having a hard time into classifying this image. So we say, okay, this is not interesting. We just skip this image, we don't label it. But what happens if we feed like a more interesting image, an image that looks a bit more different? I mean, this as a human, you probably could see that this is a cat or maybe a doll in form of the cat, but it's very hard maybe for a classifier. But still, let's say that the first classifier says, yeah, this is a cat because it's still like, maybe it's a concentrate on the facial features here and it sees that it's a cat. And maybe the second classifier would see it's more like focused on the fo on the head here and might say, yeah, this is a pirate. And the third classifier might say, yeah, this is some weird uh, creature that seems like a combination of uh, two things. Maybe this is a chimera or something. So here, like we had three classifiers and they disagreed in their prediction. Now, by doing active learning, you say that this seems to be a very interesting image. Like we had three classifiers and they are giving completely different answers for this image, which means that they are having a hard time into knowing what is this image. Now, of course, we don't know the label of this image because we are not 
checking like for every image otherwise there would have been no need for active learning but we could see what the classifiers are saying like we could make a program that sees like if the classifiers are agreeing or not and in cases they are where they are completely disagreeing with each other then we can say that maybe this is a very difficult image maybe this is an image that the classifiers are having a hard time they don't know what it is which probably means that there is nothing similar in the training data set to this image. So these uh, classifiers have not seen ever something similar to this image. And for this reason, they are giving like completely uh, misaligned predictions from each other. So if this is an interesting image, let's label it and let's put it on the, on the training data, like training data set, like label data set. So then we could retrain the classifiers also in this image. Now, more recently, if you're using neural network, what you do is probably a bit different. Like, and this would be like the more or less active learning 101, like the easiest way to do active learning with neural networks. You feed your image to your neural networks, and then you're taking the softness distribution, like the result of the last layer just before you compute the loss. For example, we have in our data set five classes, and your neural network is saying that, hey, for the first class, the probability that this belongs to the first class is like 1%. For the second and third class, it's like 0%. For fourth class, which is class cat, it's like 97%. And for the last class, it's just 2%. So it seems that your neural network is being highly confident on this image, most likely because this is like a very clearly a cat, like a very easy image. And now what we do is just we compute the entropy of this distribution here. So how we do that, like the entropy is just the sum of minus pi log pi. So when you, you go like for every value on your softmax distribution, then you just uh, multiply these values by, by its own logarithm. So here we just do like minus 0 0.01 to log of 0 0.01. And then here, because it's zero, so it's just going to be zero. And then uh, we do like minus 0 0.97 logarithm of 0 0.97. And then the same we do like for the last value. Now, if you check here, like what was these values be like? If we have a very low value, like a 0 0.01, then the logarithm of it is going to be pretty high. And also it's going to be negative because the logarithm of numbers from 0 to 1 is a negative number. So this is going to be a large negative number. But because we are multiplying by this value here, like with a small value, 0 0.01, in the end, it's going to be a pretty small value. And because we are also multiplying by a minus one, so we're adding the minus here. So in the end, this is going to be like the first value here, it's going to be a, it's going to be a small positive number. While here, logarithm of 0 0.97, it's not that big value, but it's getting multiplied by 0 0.97, so it's going to stay more or less what it is, what it was like just the logarithm here. And so it's a bit bigger than the values for the other. So, sorry, it's a bit smaller than the values for the other. So when you add all of this, like if you do the calculation uh, correctly, and I hope I did it with the calculator, you get like this value, which is like entropy is going to say 0 0.2219. So in this case, like because uh, we're doing like the entropy, we take logarithm with the base two. So what this entropy is showing, like in case you have never seen the concept, actually you have seen the concept of entropy before because you have done machine learning or deep learning courses, but the entropy kind of measures the uncertainty for this uh, distribution. So the higher the entropy is, it's uh, kind of showing that we are more uncertain about this distribution, while the lower entropy is, it says that uh, we are more certain about this distribution. So if you get like uh, most extreme cases, if here we had like just one and everything was zero, so a one hot label, then there is everything, we know everything about that distribution. We know that here it's one, everywhere else is zero. So there is not, no uncertainty there. In that case, the entropy of that distribution would be zero. While if you have a case when every value here would be like 0 0.2, like something like uniformly distributed, then that's like, it's highly uncertain. So that's the most uh, ignorant uh, distribution that we can have, like something that we cannot know anything about it because every value is the same. In that case, like the entropy is going to be like the highest possible entropy. So in this case, and actually in every case in practice, you are somewhere between these two cases. Like, you, like uh, 
that your values are not going to be like one hot label, like somewhere, like in one port, in one entry one and everywhere else, everywhere else zero, and neither are going to be like uh, uniformly distributed. What you're going to get is something in between. But in this case, it's actually closer to the case when you know everything when, because like this value is very close to one, these two values are zero and these other two are like very close to zero. So this is like almost close to an one hot labeling and for that reason we get a very low entropy here. So as you said, like image has a low entropy, like the softmax of this image, like the softmax distribution of this image has a very low entropy. So probably there is no need to label this image. Now, if you feed this image that it's a bit more difficult, then the CNNs might have like a prediction that are like not really random, like uniformly distributed, but, so, but something close to it because the network is con confused. It has never seen like something like this before. So it's not going to give uh, predictions that are confident. So here, for example, for the first class is like 0 0.2 and then it says 0 0.25, 0 0.23 and 0 0.16 for the other two classes. So now we compute the entropy of these values in the same uh, way as before. So 0 0.2, times logarithm of 0 0.2 with a minus ahead of this. And then we do this for all the values here and we get a value that it's 2.298. So image has a high entropy. So before, like for this easy image, we got like an entropy that it's like 0 0.22. For this hard image, we're getting an entropy that it's like 2.29. So all like around 10 times bigger than what we get for the easier easiest image. So what we can say is that image has a high entropy. So probably we need to label this image, which kind of makes sense because we are trying to find the images that are most dissimilar to the images in the training set. So we try to find the images where your network is uh, kind of ignorant, is not able to make good predictions on them. It's very uncertain about them. And by just measuring entropy, we could uh, go and find like these images. So what we will do next, it's uh, more or less like the active learning loop that we had here. Like uh, we compute the entropy for every image on the unlabeled data set. And then we select the top K images with the highest entropy to label them. And then we repeat this process again and again and again. So just to give the intuition here, like for easy images, the idea is to not label the easy images. And we find we define the easy images as the images for which the network is certain, which is the same as for the like the images that the, their uh, entropy of their softness distribution is low. And then we, during active learning, we label the hard images and then we define the hard images as images for which the network is very uncertain or conversely, the entropy of the softmax distribution is high. So in this case, like your neural network, like would not have labeled this image, like your, uh, would not have decided to label this image, but would have decided to label this image here. Now, someone might say, well, query by committee seems very useful. Like you were using different neuro, di different uh, classifiers and you were seeing their predictions if they're match or not. Can we do similar with uh, entropy concept and with neural networks? Can we somehow combine these two paradigms like uh, entropy, uncertainty, active learning with uh, query by committee active learning? And actually the reason, the answer is yes. Like you could fit them your, uh, image to an ensemble of classifiers. So here we are using three classifiers like CNN1, 2 and 3. So they are completely different, like they have different weights. Maybe it could be like uh, we get like a neural network, we clone it twice and then we train them independently of each other. So like we train in the same data set, but uh, by the end of the train, they are going to have different weights because of the stochastic gradient descent there or your dropout or whatever like a random process that you have during the train that you use. So we do this, like after we are trained this in three networks in the labeled data set, we feed like images to this network. For example, here we feed like this get and it's going to give us this uh, softmax distribution for this image. Then we feed this to the second network and it's going to give a softmax distribution that it's kind of similar to what we had before, but still different values because the network is going to have like different weights. 
and we do the same for the third network, it's going to give us another softmax distribution here. Then the next step is that we get like these scores and somehow we merge them. Now, one way, like probably the easiest way to merge them would be to just compute the average of every, like uh, the, the average of these values. So for example, like uh, I computed the average here and then we get like these values. So you could consider this as another softmax distribution. And actually it is a softmax distribution because it's like a probability distribution that sums to one, for example. And then we get this value here, like this final softmax distribution, and then we still compute the entropy here. So we get like minus uh, 0 0.023 times logarithm of 0 0.023, and then we do for the others, and then we get this value. Now, because we have used an ensemble, because we have used networks that are independently trained from each other, like this score is going to be much more reliable than what we had before, because before we were basing everything in only one uh, network, in only one score. Now we are basing in three different scores that are independent from each other. So this score is more reliable. And actually this is what uh, this paper did, like uh, the power of ensembles for active learning, one of the most famous papers in active learning, so CDPR 2018 by Le So they used like an ensemble of classifiers to compute the score, the uncertainty score for the active learning. And they actually did something uh, in addition to this, they also used, like, instead of just using an ensemble, they also used Monte Carlo dropout. So Monte Carlo dropout is a, a way of measuring uncertainty in neural networks. And the way how Monte Carlo dropout works, in case you have not, never seen it before, is that you train your neural network by injecting dropout during the training. Then typically, like, people, when they use dropout during the training, they... Uh, turn it off during inference and they don't use dropout. But in Monte Carlo dropout, you also use dropout during inference. However, the catch is that you don't just apply, like have an image and then use your neural network with dropout on it to make prediction for that once, but you actually make several steps. For example, you might use like 50 steps or 100 steps, which in concrete terms would mean like you get this image here, you feed to neural network, like which has like some dropout, which is like random, randomly done. And then it gives you like, for example, this value. Then you feed the same network, same uh, image to the same network with some other dropout injection. And then it's going to give you like some uh, different value. And then you do this, for example, 50 times. So in the end for every image, like you get 50 softmax distributions there. So now you can see that it looks very similar to ensembles. Like there, you were feeding the image to different neural networks. In Monte Carlo dropout, you're feeding the same image to the same network, but many times. And every time, there is going to be like a random process that it's going to do the dropout there. So in the end, you're going to get like different values. And it's actually, you could imagine this as an ensemble of uh, 50 networks, but you actually need to train only once. The only problem is that in inference, you need to apply uh, for every image, maybe like 50 times or so. So in the end, you just uh, get these values, you might uh, average them, and then you get a final softmax distribution. And then you could use the, you could apply, like you could compute the entropy in that softmax distribution and use it as your acquisition score for active learning. So what they show in this paper is that both methods work pretty well. They actually were able to outperform the other methods like entropy and some other math that we're going to show. And they also show that actually ensembles seems to work better than Monte Carlo dropout. And the reason for this is probably also make kind of sense because in ensembles, you're kind of training many neural networks. You have more weights, maybe more information. While in Monte Carlo dropouts, you're training only one neural network. And despite that you're using uh, MC dropout during inference, it improves over just having a single neural network without Monte Carlo dropout, but it's not gonna work as well as if it was like an ensemble. Still, they show that both approaches reach promising result in a couple of data sets and a couple of types of neural networks. So in the end, they show like that it's very easy to scale your active learning, like to make it work better in practice by just adding like this idea of ensembles. 
Of course, there are other approaches on uh, deep learning, and I'm going to show now several of them. One of them would be like the geometric approach, or also called like corset. And the idea here is that we want to find somehow a set of points, like for example, these blue points, that every point in the data set is near within some threshold to these points. So if you imagine like the threshold here is like this arrow, like a circle that is, uh, that its root is, uh, it's, uh, yeah, it's like as big as this arrow here, then uh, like we can see that these points here like cover all the space because every red point it is within the circle that you can build from these points. So like the goal of the core set would be like how we can find a small set of points, for example these blue points, where their neighbors are within some threshold of these blue points. So here you can see that every red point it is with, within the threshold that uh, you can put like for every blue point here. So how this can be done? So I'm just going to show like the formula from the paper, but like uh, it's not important to understand every like detail of the formula. The important part is just to understand the intuition behind it. So here they defined like the training adder, which is more or less like what adder you get in the training set and the generalization adder, which is like what uh, adder you would get in the testing set. Now here they add also this core set error, like core set loss. And the idea is to minimize like the core set loss or core set error, which in other words would be that given the initial label set as zero and some labeling budget P, we try to find a set of points that we need to label such that when we learn a model, the performance of the model on the labeled subset and that on the whole data set will be as close as possible. In other words, what this is saying is that find a set of blue points, for example, these points, that if you train a neural network in these points, it would be, it would show similar performance to if you train the neural network in the other points, like in the red points. So if this is done like per perfectly, like if you train the network in only these uh, blue points, it would reach the same results as if you trained the network in all the points in this data set, which of course is the goal of the entire active learning. And one question might be, okay, this sounds nice, of course, like we want to active learning, we want to find a minimal set of points that if you train a network there, it's going to work as well as if you trained the network in the entire data set. But how to do this in practice? And you can think of several ways how to do this. One of them might be doing clustering. For example, you do k-means, where k is the number of labeling budget for this cycle. Let's say in this cycle, you could uh, label 1000 images. So what you do, you train your neural network into the label data set. Then you get features for the, all the points in the unlabeled data set, and then you cluster these features. How do you cluster this? By doing k-means with uh, 1000 k's. K. So, and then what you do, like when you cluster these uh, images with 1000 Ks, you go and get the centroids or the point to the closest centroid for each of these clusters, for each 1000 clusters that you get. And then you use those points to label them. So, sorry, you label those points and then you put, put them on the label data set and then you train the network there. Something that works better than k-means is k-metoids, which actually is just like an intelligent, efficient application of k-means. On the paper, they actually used some other problem, which is like k-center problem, which is NP-hard, and they found an efficient way of approximating it using a greedy algorithm. Now, if you want to check the details of how they actually did this, I would recommend to read this paper because this is also one of the seminal works on active learning for deep learning. The good point is that when they show this, it sh uh, like when they uh, did uh, their core set approach into a different data set, they reached pretty good results. So they had like some network that they used and they showed that the their network works better than, for example, k or doing entropy, or of course, just randomly selecting points. And they showed this into three different data sets. Now, another method that I'm going to explain in this lecture is uh, learning loss for active learning. 
And the idea here is that wouldn't it have been good like if we could compute the cross entropy for every image like in the unlabeled, uh, for every unlabeled image in the data set. Now, of course, it's impossible to compute the cross entropy because we don't have uh, labels for those images and cross entropy is like conditional entropy into the label. So that's not, in, not something that we can do. But the author said, can we somehow make the network while we train it to also predict the loss, like to be able to compute like the cross entropy for the unlabeled images? So how we do this, let's say we train a network into your test, like classification, for example, cross entropy, but we make the network also predict the loss. So for example, you feed an image to a network, the network is going to give like some loss because like you have like uh, labels for the label parts of the data set. So the image is going to give you some loss, but you also want to teach the network to actually be able to predict that loss, not to compute it given a label, but to be able to predict it. And in this way, if you can predict the loss for an image, if you can learn to predict the loss for an image, then we could somehow approximate this loss, like so, like to approximate the cross entropy for the unlabeled images. So the idea is like, we train the network to be able to do both classification and to predict the loss. And then we use this predicted loss for all the unlabeled images to decide how interesting they are. For example, the higher the loss would be, the more interesting they are. In other words, like uh, it would be a bit like approximating cross entropy for the unlabeled images. And they give like here a schematic of this. So we have like an input, like uh, for example, after we have trained the network, like uh, we have like uh, here the unlabeled pool. And then when we, we use like the data from the unlabeled pool, we put them, we feed them to a neural network, which is going to predict the loss for this. So it's going to give you a number, for example, zero. The loss here is like cross approximation of cross entropy is going to be like 0 0.3 or something. Then we use these losses to label the the images on the unlabeled pool. And then we, sorry, and then we add like these labeled images into the input. And then we do this several times. So this is like a paper from CVPR 2019 that does this. So like the losses for the training is going to be this, like this is just the cross entropy loss plus a scaled learned loss here. And how is like this done, this predicted loss? So actually here is like this idea that uh, if done correctly, then the learning loss should be able to mimic cross entropy. And in this way, we can use it in inference despite not having ground truth. So this is just what I said uh, on the previous slide, just recapping it. Now, the idea is like, how can we learn this loss? And one way might be to regress cross entropy. So for every image on the label data set, you could easily compute its cross entropy because you have labels. So you then you could uh, add like another task for your neural network to only be able to regress the loss. So just to be able to predict this number, like from your features, or from your softmax distribution to be able to predict what is going to be the loss. And like uh, the easiest way for this is just like L2 loss adding, adding like in your neural network like this L2 loss, so to regress cross entropy. They show that this actually works pretty well in practice, but uh, there is another method that works better that they proposed and uh, so what they did is like for every mini batch on the during the training, you divide it into two halves and then you take pairs from these two halves. Now for every pair I and J, for example, let's say you had like your mini batch had uh, 100 images, you divide it into two sets of 50 images, two distinct sets of 50 images. And then you go and get like for every image, like uh, on the first set, you get another image in this other set. So let's call these images I and J. Then you get like this formula here that uh, the loss is just going to be the maximum of zero and this value here. Now what this uh, value here, actually this is just an indicator function. So if, uh, I, if Li is greater than Lj, then this value here is going to be plus one, which means that when it gets multiplied by uh, this minus one here, like it's going to be like, uh, so this value here in the end is going to be just uh, minus one. So a negative value. 
And then you see like what is Li minus Lj, which is going to give you a value that it's always positive because Li is greater than Lj. So positive value times negative value, you're going to get a negative value. So on this part here. Now, if this negative value is, is uh, smaller than a threshold epsilon that they added, which means that if uh, Li is just a bit bigger than Lj, so as I said, like if it is smaller than the epsilon, then in the end, you're going to get here like a positive value because this is like a smaller than this uh, entry here, like this negative entry, it's smaller than this positive entry. So then your value is going to be essentially whatever you get like from uh, adding these two values here. So it's going to be like a positive number. But if this value here, like if Li is much greater than Lj, then this is going to be like a very high negative value. So when you add it, when you add a small epsilon to this value here, you're going to get a ne negative value still. And then the maximum here is zero. And the idea for this is that they want to concentrate to focus only in pairs that are close to each other because those are like the most difficult pairs. And conversely, you can do your calculation and the same can be done like if Li is like smaller than Lj, then here you get a negative value, but here you get a positive value because this part here is going to be negative, negative times negative, you get positive, but positive times a negative value, you're going to get like a negative value here. And then again, it depends on the epsilon here. So in other words, what this is measuring is just the absolute value of these two and then you add like a minus here, like the minus absolute value of these uh, two images here that you get, plus this epsilon here. So they show that this actually works better than just regressing the cross entropy on their experimental setting, despite that it doesn't look extremely intuitive. So in the end, like what they did, like we just have like this input here, you have like the network, which is going to make like predictions. And then in, because they're using rest nets in every level of rest net, they are going to do like this loss production prediction module, like more or less uh, add like a few layers and then computing this loss here. And then in the end, they just add like the two loss, like the predicted loss, like learned loss, and also the real cross entropy loss. And here, just like the schematic of the network. So because they are using a rest net, so they have like four levels and they get like, at the end of each level, they get like, uh, like the features here, they do global average pooling, some fully connected network with Relu. And then they do this for all the levels, they concatenate the values, add another layer here and then predict the loss, the learned loss. While here you have the cross entropy loss. Obviously, on inference, you cannot do cross-entropy cross loss, but what you do, you feed your image to the network, like when you're doing active learning, you get like all these features here, you concatenate them, you add like a fully connect layer, and then you predict the loss. So using the same approach as I just explained. And then you get like these losses that we predicted for each image, we sort them, and then we select the top K of those images to label them. They show the results and uh, what they show is that it actually works better than, uh, so their approach seems to work better than CoreSat. It also seems to work better than Entropy and also better, of course, than if you just randomly sample images. What was very interesting in this work is that they show that you could use the same method without any modification to do object detection. And even there, they show that they reach state-of-the-art results. So this is like in Pascal VOC data set that I mentioned last time. And if you're using this approach, you get results that are better than, for example, if you were doing entropy or core set, like maybe a couple of points better. So this is pretty interesting because they show that a state-of-the-art active learning classification method is also a state-of-the-art active learning deep object uh, detection method. So they kind of unified classification with object detection using the same method for active learning and reaching state-of-the-art results in both tasks. But since, uh, as I mentioned, yeah, like it's possible to translate classification methods to object detection, 
However, by doing so, like one problem is that you are only using the classification score, not also using the localization score, because as I mentioned also in your in the previous lecture, like in object detection, your task is to find like the location of an object and also to find its class. So if you use your method, everything that you're basing is only on the class prediction. You're not basing anything on the localization prediction. But maybe that information could be useful also for active learning. And here I'm going to show like just to give the intuition behind a method that we just published like in this ICV. So it was uh, published just like one month ago or so. But the idea is to use like a mixture of Gaussian like to add like into your uh, like in your detector, for example, SSD de detector, we are going to use like uh, both the information for the localization and for classification. Now how to do this, like we add like a localization head where like we get the values for the localization and then we approximate like three values like the variance, the uh, mean and the mixture here, like these three values. And because we're doing like a mixture of, val of uh, Gaussian, so you could imagine this like in high level, like as an ensemble, we do this like several times, like from one to K. And the same we do also for classification. So we're kind of separating the classification information from the localization information using this type of uh, mixture of Gaussians. And in this way, we show that if we use also the localization information, and again, like if you want to know like how we did this in details, I would recommend you to read this paper. But what, we want, but I, what I want to show in this lecture is that if you're able to somehow use the localization information, in addition to classification information, then you could get a more reliable score, because, which kind of makes sense because you're, you're using two sources of information, two useful sources of information. So you get a more reliable score, a better score, and cons consequently, you could get like a better result. And as we showed here, we were able to easily reach a state-of-the-art result, which kind of makes sense because the methods that I uh, described before, they were like one or two years old methods. So this method works a bit better, it's more recent. But what we showed here is that we are significantly outperforming uh, core set or entropy or learning loss or random sampling, of course. And then we show that we reach more or less similar results as ensemble methods or MC dropout methods. Actually, maybe we are slightly better or more there, there. But the nice thing is that if you use like this method, we need to train only one neural network. While if you want, for example, to use ensembles, we need to train three neural networks. So it takes three times as long and it needs three times as many computational resources. So in this way, by just using this method that uh, uses two sources of information, the classification and the localization, we need to spend only 30% of resources and time to train our neural network. And you can say the same for MC dropout, there actually you need to train only one neural network, but in inference, you need to apply like, uh, for example, at least 50 or 25 times like every image. So then your inference is going to be like 25 or 50 times as long as the inference of this method here. So sure, the results are only as good as ensembles and MC dropout, but the time to get this result is much, is much smaller and also the computational resources that you need to train or to infer, like to train the ensembles or to infer the labels for the MC dropout, to infer the scores for MC dropout, it's going to be much higher than for this method here. Now the final topic that I want to discuss today is maybe we're forgetting the elephant in the box. Because in the last lecture we showed how we are able to use the unlabeled data by doing semi-supervised learning. Here today we are showing how we can find the best set of data to be able to, to do uh, supervised learning, so fully supervised learning. Now, both of these seems to work pretty well, like in SSL, like if you're doing, if you're using the unlabeled data during the training, you get a significant boost in performance. Also in active learning, if you're using like your data, like if you're using only the most informative data, you're selecting those data and then you're getting like a really good result. Now the question is, 
This method seems a bit similar to each other. In both cases, you're using your neural network to either use the data that is unlabeled to train on them somehow, or maybe to choose those data that are most informative to be labeled. So is it a way to combine these two methods so we get the best of both worlds, so we get a further boost on the results? And the answer is, as you might imagine, undoubtedly yes. So this is like a paper from the previous ECCV, which is like called uh, consistency-based semi-supervised active learning towards minimizing labeling costs. And what they did is extremely simple. So this is done for classification. So they train an network with mixed match. So we explained mixed match in the previous lecture. In case you need to do a recap of it, just go and watch the previous lecture. But the idea was that you just do like several augmentation and then you try to minimize the difference between the predictions of the original image and its augmentations. So what they did, like they just took the mixed match method and they trained the mat a network in mix mix match. Then in inference, instead of using entropy or whatever, that or just doing randomly sampling, like for the unlabeled images, they used the same loss as uh, for the train, like the same mix match loss to compute the inconsistency of the samples. So the same loss that they used for uh, semi-supervised learning, they are using also as an acquisition score for uh, active learning. So they are re repurposing the mix match loss to do active learning with it. And then after you compute the inconsistency of these samples, they just label the samples with the highest inconsistency, and then they just add them in the labeled part of the data set, and then they continue doing this several times, like for every active learning step. As you can imagine, the results were like far better than everything else. So here it's like supervised method, doing some active learning either with uniform, so this is just like random sampling, entropy or uh, case center, so core set. And here it's like the number of labeled samples in total. So as you see, for example, if you're having like only 100 images, like just using supervised learning, you get like 41% accuracy, but using their, like the semi-supervised learning, they get like 84% or so accuracy. Then if you add active learning on top of that, you see like, for example, if you add like another 50 images here, the performance improved to, I don't know, 46 or something, like for the other methods, maybe for uh, case center a bit better, like 48%. But using this method, the performance boosts even more so. And you can see like the difference is like extreme. So it's like 30, 40 points difference. Now someone might say, sure, but maybe the difference is coming because here you're using a semi-supervised method, here you're using a supervised method. So of course, semi-supervised learning is going to work better than supervised learning. And maybe this is not an active learning, a good active learning method. It's just, you were just using a good semi-supervised learning method. They actually show that this is not the case. They say, okay, let's do semi-supervised learning everywhere, like for uniform, for entropy, and for uh, core set, and also, of course, for their method. And now th let's see the results. And the results, again, are much better for uh, this method that is based on inconsistency. So we see it here, like, for example, uniform, like, Actually, we are in this case here. So if you just do, if you just randomly sample like uniform, we get like maybe 87.78% or so. If you're actually doing entropy, you get a bit better, like half a point improvement during active learning. If you do case center, you get another half improvement. And if you use inconsistency, so this method, you get another one and a half point improvement. And this seems to scale for all the other, uh, like adding more and more data. So in all cases, it seems that using inconsistency as acquisition score is better than using uh, any other acquisition score like case center or entropy. Now, something similar, we just uh, released actually the paper in archive and it's this paper. So this was, uh, it's like a fully object detection paper for active learning for object detection. And here we started from a counter example. Let's get like an image here that it's very hard to classify for a neural network. And the reason for this is that we are using like Pascal VOC data set, and this is like potted plant, which is like the hardest 
hardest uh, class in the data set when the network has like the most difficult time to give good prediction for this. So we using like a network to make prediction for this image <clears throat> and the network is going to not be accurate. It's going to say, hey, this is a bird with a very high probability, like 99%. And then we say, okay, what would have happened? Like, do you remember? You probably remember the method from last week when uh, we explained like the consistency-based semi-supervised learning. What happened if you do some augmentation to this image? For example, as we're doing here, we're doing like a flipping, horizontal flipping, and then we use a neural network here to make prediction. And it's going to say that, hey, this is a bird with 62% probability. Now we analyzed what would the other methods do about this, like the other, either semi-supervised learning methods or active learning methods. For example, if you're using the uncertainty, like the entropy, we want to measure the uncertainty of this image, the network is going to say, hey, I'm extremely confident about this image. Like this is a bird with 99% probability. So the entropy of this image is going to be very low. And so we are not going to label this image. Now let's see what uh, semi-supervised learning is going to do here like a pseudo labeling, like one of the family of pseudo of uh, semi-supervised learning is going to say, I'm very confident that this thing is a bird, 99% confident. So I'm just pseudo labeling it. And now you, not only you didn't label this image, which actually it's a very interesting image because the network has been completely wrong there. So adding this would benefit the training, labeling this would benefit the training, but you're actually pseudo labeling this image with a wrong label. And now your train is going to get worse because you're adding like an image, a hard image with the wrong uh, label. So you're kind of adding noise in your data set. So by just doing pseudo labeling here, seems that it's simply not a very good idea. But what would happen if you would do semi-supervised learning like consistency based? Well, as you see, like you, you train a network and then you're seeing like these predictions. And still the prediction are not matching with each other. Like in one case, it's saying 99%. In the other case, it's saying 62%. So here the network is very confident for the same image. Here the network is not confident at all. So it seems that the consistency-based semi-supervised learning has not been able to really minimize the loss between these two images. So it's actually not doing a proper job. It's not being able to ut fully utilize this image. Clearly, the way to fully utilize these type of images would be to label them. So what we did here in our work is that we defined a score that is based on the inconsistency. So an active learning score that it is based on the inconsistency between an image and that augmented version of it. So we just would get like the entire probability distribution of this image, which in this case is going to be 0 0.99 for bird and 0 0.01 combined for all the other classes. While here it's going to be a bit more distributed. So like for the highest class 0 0.62 and for the others, like the remaining 38%. So we're just going to compute the inconsistency between this image. And for that, we could just uh, repurpose the score from the consistency-based semi-supervised learning method of Young et al. that I explained on the previous lecture on semi-supervised learning, and we're going to get a score. But in general, we also know that for easier images, like you could just use the entropy and that is going to be highly informative because for images where the network is really doing a good job, like it's able to predict them confidently and correctly, like the entropy, as we showed before, it's a very good uh, score for active learning. So what we do, we get like the consistency that it's kind of works pretty well for this type of hard images. And then we also compute for the same image, the entropy, which typically works well for easy images. Then we just multiply these two scores and then we get a final score, which is just the inconsistency weighted for the entropy. And the hope is that by adding, by multiplying these two scores that are completely different to each other, one is based on inconsistency, the other is based on entropy. One seems to perform well in hard images, in images when the network seems to be mostly wrong, the other seems to perform well on images when the network seems to be mostly right. So if we multiply these two scores, we get a very reliable score for object detection. We actually 
So, and here I just want to remind like maybe a bit like uh, the method of Young et al, like the semi-supervised learning method, but I explained it into details in the previous lecture. So you can just pause this video and go to the previous lecture to check it. But the idea is that you get an image, you do a, a flip, like a horizontal flip, then you get like the predictions for both these two images, and then you define a consistency loss when you're kind of measuring how uh, your network is making different prediction from each other. For example, then to minimize this loss, you just use the KL diversion from uh, for classes. Like uh, you get the distribution of the original and the augmented version, and then you do the KL diversion between them. And also like for the bounding box, you just use like the the equation that I gave in the previous lecture, which kind of is just the L2 loss between all the coordinates. So if you're doing this, so if you're using this method as a semi-supervised learning, then during active learning, we have like labeled data and unlabeled data. So we have trained the network first into all these type of data. So now we feed this data to the detector and then we get the acquisition score that I mentioned. So which is going to be just the multiplication, the product of uh, inconsistency with the entropy. And here we have now a decision to make. First of all, we say that if the image has a very high score, let's say we can uh, we have a budget of 1000 images to label. So we get like the images with the, the top 1000 images with the highest score, and then we send them for human labeling. So we're doing active learning for this 1000 images. The remaining images are unlabeled, but we, we do a bit more now here. So we say, okay, we removed all the images were were highly interesting, like uh, when the network was highly uncertain or highly inconsistent. So the most difficult images in the data set, we set to humans to label. So now for the remaining images, they probably the network is not going to be very confident and wrong. So if it's going to be confident, it's probably going to be correct because we have already removed those images which were like very hard. So for images where the network is confident, so the, the entropy is very low for them, or conversely, like the highest score, like if you go to the softmax distribution, you do an orgmax there, so you check the highest score. So if that score is above some threshold, you just pseudo-label them. And we spent most of the previous lecture on pseudo-labeling, how to do that. So we just use like a pseudo-labeling method to pseudo-label them. And in the end, there are still going to be a few images that are neither going to be like uh, actively labeled nor going to be pseudo labeled. So for those images in the next cycle, we are just going to use as unlabeled data, but as unlabeled data in a semi-supervised learning setting, so using consistency base. So in this way, we're trying to unify everything. We're trying to unify two families of semi-supervised learning. So the consistency-based uh, semi-supervised learning, the pseudo-label-based semi-supervised learning with active learning, that it's also using two types of families, like the inconsistency-based uh, active learning and entropy-based active learning. So as you can imagine, like when we did like this uh, framework that tries to unify everything, we get significantly better results than all the previous methods. So like here, the black line is like our method. And so if you compare with active learning methods, so we are like far better than all the previous active learning methods. So you can see like the difference between them, it's relatively small, but then the difference of them to our method, it's much bigger. Furthermore, we show that by just using 18% of the label data, we get as good results as this method by using all these images. So here with uh, less than 3000 images, we are getting the same results. Actually, we are getting, yeah, we are getting the same results as these methods using 7000 images. We did something similar. So because we're using both pseudo labeling and semi-supervised learning like consistency based, we compared our method to this uh, two semi-supervised learning method. And again, we are quite a bit better than them. Uh, we did these experiments in addition to VOC dataset, we did also in MS uh, Microsoft Coco dataset. And again, we get in the same setting. So even compared to the method from ICCV that is just like two months ago old, we are getting like much better results. 
And of course, compared to semi-supervised learning, we are also getting much better results. We did a very interesting ablation study in this uh, work when we said, like, how do these methods work into high-performing and low-performing classes? So by high-performing classes, I mean classes where the network is giving, like, uh, in general, like, uh, high scores. For example, in bicycle, the network seems to be correct around 80%. While low-performing classes are the classes where the network is giving bad results. For example, bottle here when it's reaching only 40%, or... Uh, Pottage plan that I mentioned, the hardest class in the data set. So we get like three representatives, the three highest, uh, the three classes that perform best in the network and the three classes that perform worst in the network. And then we saw like which score it reaches best result. From what we saw is that the entropy seems to perform very well in classes where the network reaches high result, which kind of makes sense because if the network is really good at predicting for this class, then also, if you use its uh, softmax distribution for the entropy, like it's uh, very reliable information, so the entropy here is going to perform very well. But for classes where the network doesn't work well, for example, potted plant or bottle, then inconsistency seems to perform really great, while entropy actually completely fails. It doesn't even work much better than random sampling. So in this way, we're kind of finding the best of both worlds. Like, like for classes where the network is good, like make good predictions, so entropy works well. For classes where the network make bad prediction, inconsistency works well. So if we unify these two scores with uh, what we call like SSL unified by multiplying them, then we're reaching decent results in more or less all classes. And that's also what we can see from the ablation study here is that SSL unified in both data sets reaches results that are both better than inconsistency and entropy. So as I said, like entropy performs well on samples coming from high performing classes, like from easy classes, while the inconsistency performs well on samples coming from hard classes. And combining them works better, of course, and then adding pseudo labels works even better, which is like on the ablation study is like the black line here like the one that reaches the best results. So in this way, we kind of ablated that every part of our framework kind of improves results. Like you could use entropy for easy class, inconsistency for hard classes, combine them to get good results everywhere, add pseudo labeling to get even better results. And so we are just trying to unify like uh, two different SL paradigms with two different active learning methods to reach the best result in this way to exploit the data as much as possible. What we also show is that pseudo labeling tends to help everywhere. So if you don't do active learning, actually, this is not the case. If you just add pseudo labeling there, then it might uh, help in some classes and it might uh, not help in other classes. But with our method, when we're doing like this smart active learning, then if you're doing pseudo labeling it tends to perform everywhere. Of course, there is one catch that you need to be careful to what threshold you put for the pseudo labeling. So if you're very liberal in what your pseudo labeling, for example, you say we pseudo label every image that is confident more, that the network for that image is confident more than 0 0.5, then your network is just going to degenerate because you're adding a lot of noise. Like if you're doing so, like half of the pseudo labels you're adding are wrong, so then uh, the network is just going to get confused and reach very bad results. But if you're being conservative in pseudo labeling, for example, you're pseudo labeling only the images for which the network is uh, very confident, for example, 99% confident, then pseudo labels are really going to perform well and improve the results of your method. So just to conclude, I would say that uh, active learning is a very useful approach and it works very well when you're dealing with a limited labeling budget. In my opinion, it's also a very underutilized approach because if you check like semi-supervised learning papers or metric learning papers, you have like so many papers coming in every conference. So for every conference, you might get like 20, 30 papers that are kind of improving state of the art or just giving some new like, cool idea that improves some part of the, of the method. But in active learning, this, this is not the case. So like uh, 
I just explained like a few methods and there are not many other methods there. So people are not using like research or not doing much research in active learning. While it seems that it's very important, like companies that are doing autonomous driving, they are really desperate to come with uh, good ways of uh, being able to find the most interesting data in the data set, because clearly you cannot just label billions of images. You They have to come with ways of labeling only the most important, most interesting images in the data set. So I think here there's a lot of room to improve and there's a lot of interesting cool uh, research directions. From my anecdotal evidence that I have used a lot of active learning methods, it seems that despite what papers say in classification, entropy performs really well. Despite being maybe the easiest active learning method, often it outperforms state-of-the-art approaches. For example, like approaches like learning loss or variational active learning. In my opinion, like, and by that I mean I have test this method in different settings, not, not only in the settings that are in the paper, but also in other settings. Entropy seems to perform more or less as well as them, maybe even better than them. Maybe like uh, actually core set is probably a bit different because core set in some cases, in my experience, outperforms entropy, but in other cases, out entropy outperforms core set. And in samples, of course, improve over any other method which kind of makes sense. If instead of training one network, you train like five network, and then you just use the same method, but you just merge the results of these five networks, you're going to get better results. So if you want like to boost your results as much as you can, like in everything else, you could easily add the ensemble. So there is like one saying that if you want another 2%, like to improve the result by 2%, you don't need to change the method, you just need to train multiple networks, like an ensemble of multiple networks, and then just merge the results, and you're going to get that final 2% that you need. And finally, I think that it would be very interesting for active learning to be combined with semi-supervised learning. So far, I'm aware of only these two papers that I explained, one from our group and NVIDIA, and one from, I believe, from Google that tried to combine these two approaches because they are both in isolation seems to perform very well, like SSL, like reaches really stellar results by just not by just using the unlabeled data. Active learning improves by adding like most uh, informative data in your data set. So if you find a way, a smart way of combining these two approaches, then you're going to, your network is going to reach better results than using either of them in isolation. So I think there's a lot of uh, promising research direction going here. With this done, like uh, I would just uh, say thank you for attending this lecture and actually thank you for attending this course. So this is the last lecture of the course. So just Merry Christmas, Happy New Year and have fun like in the uh, holiday section. Thank you.